Okay, one more time. Good morning, church. Good morning. Okay, I'm like, we are awake, confirmed. Usually I have the mic, but today I'm like, I'm going to actually try to speak loud. So, I don't know, I'm always so soft spoken. Okay, whatever. Anyway, welcome to Covenant Church, where we're all about prayer, love, love for our community, and worship. Um, have a few quick things. No evening worship tonight. Pastor Brooks might have a little bit of a cold, so that's why we have the pulpit back today. But don't be scared. You can't get infected. It's on the antibiotics. Not today. Not today. Anyway, um, okay, let's see. We also have coffee, snacks, the usual, you know. And then I think Pastor Brooks might be announcing this, but I kind of want to take the announcement. We've got a youth group this Saturday, if you guys know any youth. It's fun. It gets a little rowdy. I'm there. We get a little competitive. But I want to share the three rules we have, just as a little preface, you know. We have love God, of course, a youth group. Have fun and don't die. So it's a really good youth group. If you guys know any youth, that'd be great. It's going to be a great time. All right, Pastor Brooks. Thank you, Angie. Uh, well, friends, we've uh, heard some uh, exciting announcements. Uh, let's be called to worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 117, uh, where the psalmist writes, and God calls us to worship with this. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Friends, let's stand and turn into hymn number 164 in our red hymns. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, the honors of your name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of rainy sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. Is but a veil for me. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor believe. Hear him, ye deaf, his crazy tongue, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful thing to come into your presence, singing of the name of Jesus. That is the name that does charm our fears. Oh, we have peace and joy at that name. Father, we thank you that we have been cleansed of sin in Christ. We thank you for the joy of coming to worship you this morning, our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may our worship be pleasing and acceptable in your sight as we do come into your presence in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's continue our worship by confessing our faith. Uh, we'll turn to the confession of faith that's printed in our bulletins. And we have opportunity now to stand uh, firm with those who have been believers in the past and making a declaration of our faith in an ever-changing world. And so I ask you then, dear Christian, what is it that you believe? Well, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we come now to our confession of sin, where we have opportunity now to confess our sins unto God corporately and then privately as we remember God's great love and mercy toward us. And so with that in mind, we're going to confess our sins from Psalm 139, uh, verses 1 to 3. Let's pray uh, this unto God together, uh, confessing our sins, uh, starting in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. God does know us. Let's confess our sins privately. Heavenly Father, we do confess these sins unto you as we are reminded of your mercy and love toward us in the Lord Jesus, the full forgiveness of sins. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to confess them, knowing that in Christ they've been wiped away, never to be thought of again. Uh, may you bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, please stand and hear this assurance of pardon from God's word. Speaking of Christ, it says in Ephesians, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Oh, God's grace is rich toward us. Let's turn to Psalm 115a in our blue psalter. Not unto us, Lord, no, not us, but to your name above. Bring glory for your faithfulness and for your steadfast love. Why should the heathen nations say, why does their God keep still? For our God lives in heaven high and carries out his will. Of gold and silver are their gods, which men craft carefully, and give them mouths that cannot speak and eyes that cannot see. Though they have ears, they cannot hear. The nose no sin has found. Their hands can't feel, their feet can't walk. The throats can make no sound. Whoever makes these lifeless gods, these idols which are vain, Whoever puts his trust in them, in time becomes the same. Please be seated. (laughs) 
Well, I'll stay back a little ways, but we do have a children's message uh, for the young people and for those young at heart. Uh, this is for you. Uh, I brought with me this morning my pencil sharpener. Um, I'm a, uh, an avid uh, enthusiast of pencils, and so uh, my pencil sharpener, I'll let you check it out later if you want the ultra finest point. Uh, this is the sharpener. Uh, many hours of research spent. And uh, I got, uh, at a, uh, it's, it, it wasn't expensive, but it's the best. Um, and, and it's important, right? When you're writing with a pencil, you want a nice sharp edge on there, unless you're an artist like Ellie or something. But most of the time, when you're writing, you, you want something sharp uh, to make a, a fine line. Uh, I'll tell you, for the hours of research I put into my pencil sharpener, which is, I know, is <laughs> not important at all. Um, what really is important uh, is the, the sharpness of our minds or, or the pointedness of our minds for the things of Christ. I'll tell you, when you're writing with a pencil, you know, it, it, it becomes dull very quickly as you're scraping it along the paper. Well, the world, friends, as we live in a place where there are so many changes and ups and downs and hardships and dangers, uh, even for the believer, it can dull down our sense of God, uh, God's love for us, who God is, our relationship to him. And so our call as Christians throughout the week, uh, every day, is to have our minds renewed, uh, sharpened, we could say, at the things of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, we're called to, to, have, uh, to live with our minds renewed. Uh, renewed. We are often wanting to go back to the old way. Uh, that's our tendency, to go either to something apart from Christ uh, in, in not living for him, or in something that wants to place our righteousness based on works, the things that we do, which is also apart from Christ. Instead, we need to have our minds sharpened to Christ. And the way that we do that, of course, is, as you know, by uh, studying his word. Uh, by the fellowship of believers, by communing with God in prayer, uh, by the reading of good Christian books. All of these things throughout the week are things that sharpen our minds unto the things of Christ. It's especially important, I think, for our young people who uh, live in a world where they do not have opportunity to hear much of Christ. Uh, and so we can pray for them uh, that this church would do well in ministering to our community, uh, that they too can have minds renewed after God. So our encouragement is, uh, as we go from here, to stay sharp uh, for the things of Christ by doing these things uh, together. Uh, let's pray, particularly for our young people. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to have our minds renewed uh, for, uh, for you uh, and the love of Christ towards us. Uh, we pray especially for our young people. We pray for you, Rami, uh, here this morning. Pray for Elizabeth, uh, that, that we as a church would do well in uh, encouraging them in the Lord. We pray for those in our community, young people, uh, that as well uh, we would do well to encourage them in the Lord. We pray for the youth group on Saturday, uh, that the youth who come would be encouraged at the things of Christ. Bless us as a church as we seek daily uh, to have our minds renewed in the things of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I'm going to ask uh, Arnold uh, to come forward and uh, we'll worship God with our tithes and offerings. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give unto you in our worship. Uh, may you bless us as we seek uh, to give back a portion of that which you've given to us. May you use it for your purpose and kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, before we turn uh, to God's word, let's turn again to him in prayer. We do have several uh, prayer requests to remember together this morning, including um, good news from, uh, we've been praying for the angel's uh, brother-in-law's father. Um, and uh, we were praying for him as he's had uh, issues with his pancreas. And, and, and things have gone well. Uh, he's had some new treatment that, that's really got going well, and so we'll praise God for that. Um, also, uh, uh, Angel had a good uh, idea to pray for the situation in Israel, um, which seems to, uh, by God's grace, have been uh, quickly uh, resolved. and so Or not necessarily resolved, but uh, things were not as uh, bad, maybe, as uh, it could have been. And so we'll pray that things continue in that way. Um, also, uh, some more uh, good news. We've been praying for Jeanette in South Carolina, um, who has cancer. Well, she had two surgeries uh, here recently, um, and both of those went really well, and she will not need chemo, is uh, what the doctors are uh, seeking or saying. So that's really good. Uh, so many things to praise God for. Also, uh, we'll pray for the family of Pearl, who died this week. That's um, Ellie's uh, daughter's uh, grand or daughter-in-law's grandmother. Ellie's daughter-in-law's grandmother, uh, Evangeline and Genevieve, who are often here for the children's sermons. Their grandmother uh, as well. Um, also, uh, the neighbor of Damien and Annette, Fred, has passed away, and so we'll pray for her uh, to him. For Damien and Annette uh, as well as they minister to their neighbor. Um, friends, uh, we'll continue one more. We'll continue to pray for Roxanne and Anella here in Burbank as, uh, as Roxanne has cancer. Uh, many uh, good things to pray for, many hard things as well. Let's turn to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had already uh, to come into your presence and worship as we extol you, our God, who is the creator, uh, the creator of all things that exist, uh, who created all things out of nothing. And then a uh, God with such uh, power and might and glory, uh, we know is, is not a God who then left us to useless idols, uh, as we sang about, as if those would uh, be any sort of God to us. Uh, no, uh, you are a God who's drawn near to us, who's encouraged us to draw near to him, uh, to you, who has demonstrated great love for us. The scriptures tell us that you love the world, and you demonstrated your love in the giving of your son, we confess that we are a sinful people, and yet we give you thanks for the Lord Jesus, uh, who lived and died and rose again, that we would have life in him. As we sang a moment ago about those idols, Father, we, we know that there is no other God uh, apart from you. And what a wonderful God you are, a uh, God of steadfast love. And so we do come uh, praising you with prayer. We come uh, knowing that you hear and answer our prayer requests. And Father, we do come to you with many uh, requests this morning and praises. And Father, we praise you uh, for the good news about Angel's brother-in-law's father, uh, how these treatments have gone well. Uh, we pray that they would continue to do so and that he would be encouraged in the Lord. We thank you for the good news of Jeanette in South Carolina, how these surgeries uh, have gone well, and, uh, and it seems that she'll avoid chemotherapy. Father, we thank you for that good news, answered prayer. We pray for Hannah as she seeks to minister to her friend. Uh, 
of uh, may you encourage them in the Lord. Father, we pray uh, with thanksgiving for uh, what the situation uh, being more, a little bit more stable this morning in Israel. Uh, Father, we pray that the conflict would cease uh, and that people would come to know you in Christ. Uh, we pray for peace in Israel and that whole region. Father, knowing the way in which you answer prayer, we know that you hear our prayers and you do answer them. <coughs> Excuse me. We pray as well uh, for the family of Pearl. Uh, who died this week. Um, Father, we know that there will be uh, many changes in their lives. Father, we pray uh, that you would work this out to your glory. Father, we pray for the family of Fred, uh, who also has died this week. Father, we pray uh, for their comfort in the Lord. Uh, we pray the same for Pearl's family as well, of course. Father, we pray particularly with Fred, <laughs> that you would bless Damien and Annette as they seek to care well for their neighbor, uh, for, for the family of their neighbor, uh, that they would have opportunities to speak of the hope in Christ, we pray. Father, we pray as well for Roxanne uh, here in Burbank, uh, the dear friend of Dave and Christine. We pray that Roxanne would be uh, heal of her cancer and comforted in the Lord. Pray for her daughter, Anella. <clears throat> Help us as a church to minister well to her. Father, we ask all these things as we turn to your word. Uh, we thank you for your word. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity to hear it preached this morning. Uh, may you bless us in these things, we pray. Change us by your word. Uh, make us more in love with Christ. Uh, willing to flee from sin and to cling unto the hope of eternal life in the Lord Jesus. May you bless uh, the word as it's preached to us by your spirit. Father, we ask all these things as you would seek to uh, build up your church here at Burbank. We pray for continued uh, uh, good providence and favor from you as we seek to love our community well with the sharing of the gospel. May you bless us, we pray. Father, we ask all these things in uh, to you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Christ. <coughs> As we pray now that prayer which you taught us, praying together. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. <coughs> Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I made it. Um, we, uh, friends, I, I'm uh, very uh, pleased to be with you. Uh, I knew I would not be up for preaching, and so I've invited uh, a friend of mine. <coughs> Reverend Kent Morlock to come and preach to us over Zoom. Um, I got to know Kent. <coughs> well, Kent, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm not sure I'm up for it, but uh, we're very glad that you're here, brother. Um, let me uh, turn on, just give me about one second here. <coughs> I'll turn on the screen. Well, yeah, go to the satellite. All right. Well, greetings, uh, brothers and sisters. By way of introduction, my name is Kent Morlock. I was uh, born and bred in California, in um, Anaheim, California. 
and in God's providence um, brought me here to Tennessee, right on the coast of the Mississippi River at the community called Millington, Tennessee in 2013. And we've been doing ministry here, my family and my five children. Um, and thanking the Lord for his, his blessings here. As a pastor, I, um, someone who likes to go through texts of the scriptures and we're going through the gospel of John, but we're doing it with a unique focus. And that is concentrating on the word world. So our series is the world according to John. And the word world is a little bit elusive in its multiple contexts. And I'm trying to get a good handle on, on what it really means for God to love the world and yet at the same time for us not to be a part of the world. So um, weighing those attributes is kind of what we've been doing. So um, I sent along, but I don't know, do you, does anyone have anything that looks like this in front of them? You do, all right. So it's it's a color coded um, view of the of the seventeenth chapter, the first part of the seventeenth chapter of John, and uh, I'm going to make reference to that in a little bit as we conclude. But I thought I would just do a little bit bit of a review of what we call salvation history, the drama of redemption. It kind of gets us to John seventeen, and. Um, most of us have heard that little limerick gospel song, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. It makes me wonder, what is, mm -hmm. what is the world here for then if this is not, I mean, are we just in a Petri dish just until we become something else? And um, what, what can we learn about our relationship to the world? And if we go back to the very beginning, which is a good place to start, the world was given to a man, Adam, and to his bride, Eve, and they were given the world to steward it and to care for it and to enjoy the fruits and blessings of it. Um, and it was a glorious situation. Adam and Eve and their, and their relationship with the Lord in the world. But we all know that category called the fall. There was sin and rebellion and disobedience so that man forfeited um, his right to rule the world and it seems that as you read through the curses that came upon him there's the sweat of his brow there's thorns and thistles there's pain in the world that the world is somewhat inhospitable to mankind now but in god's goodness, there's a promise, the first mention of the gospel in Genesis 3.15. You're familiar with the words that the woman would have a seed and the serpent would have a seed, and they would be at enmity with one another. There would not be, there would be no sense of communion. <laughs> there would be a hostile relationship. And it appears that as we read through the Old Testament, the Tanakh, of the Jewish Bible, that what are we seeing but a, a line being preserved by God to bring about his anointed one and the rest of the world, which are hostile to the people of God. There are plenty of Old Testament references that speak of God bringing judgment and fire and fury to the world, that there will be bodies laid waste on the hillsides and the carrion coming to devour them. Very austere passages of God's judgment. And yet in the mix of those judgment passages, there's this very unique reference to God actually saving the Gentiles, bringing them to equal status with the people of Israel, that their worship would be accepted. And those are very interesting contrasts. In fact, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah is one of those contrasts. 
a judgment motif, and then followed by, you know what, I'm going to receive offerings from the Gentiles. And so this becomes part of the discussion of, well, then who's, who's a part of the world if the, the non-Jewish people can be accepted just as the Jewish people? And we get to the time of Christ, and Jesus is speaking with Pharisees and saying they're not even fulfilling God's purposes. They themselves seem to be at enmity with God because they've taken the law of God and they've corrupted it and made it look more like rules to make themselves look good. They actually seem to become more part of the world. And the people with whom Jesus does ministry, those evil tax collectors and prostitutes, all those worldly people, Jesus is now having success with them. It's just a big confluence of who, who is Jesus really coming for? What is his mission going to accomplish? Um, I use as an illustration the Apostle Peter when he uh, is told to go to Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. He first has this vision about food that he's told to kill and eat, and it's all not kosher. And Peter would never stoop to doing something as simple as to eating that kind of food. And then, and then the Lord tells him, look, it, I've called some things clean now. There are things that are clean now. I want you to remember this. And this, of course, this prepares him to go meet Cornelius, this Roman centurion, uncircumcised, person who's not from the promised land, he's an occupier of the promised land. And the very first thing that Peter says when he steps into his house is, you know, I shouldn't be here. This is, I'm violating all the rules. But at, at the result of that meeting, there is now a, new, a whole new mission field for Peter and the church. People whom they thought were formally rejected by God are actually Per their Old Testament scriptures, are the people for whom God has come to save. And so when we read about the world in John, in the early chapters, we see the unfolding of the expanse, the horizon of whom that Jesus has come to save. Um, let me offer this to you for a moment. Think about that time when Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And Jesus says that most famous Bible verse that we've all been taught to memorize. For God so loved the world. And I can imagine the Pharisee saying, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. God does not love the world. God loves Israel. God loves everyone who keeps the Sabbath. God loves everyone who pays their tithes. And he could go through a whole list of people whom God loved, but it would not it would not have been the world. God would not love the world. The world is the group of people that hates Israel, and God's going to judge them in that context. But no, Jesus is saying he has a new mission to, as the seed of the woman, to bring a whole new group of people out of the world. And it's going to be of both those of the Gentile stock and the stock of Abraham. So just by a matter of a brief review of the Gospel of John, and if you want to just turn, if you have a Bible, and you want to turn to John chapter 1, um, in verse 9, it's a little bit of a contrast with John the Baptist and Jesus, we read that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Here's the, the new mission field of Jesus. It's going to be the world, not just Israel. John the Baptist was trying to get Israel to repent. But Jesus, compare and contrast with John the Baptist is going to be the world. That's going to be his domain. He is going to be the true redeemer who is the true seed of the woman. 
And we keep reading verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. How could the world know him apart from some kind of revelation that they were not privileged to? God only revealed himself to Israel. And that's an interesting point because he goes on to say he came to his own, the people to whom God really did reveal himself, and his own did not receive him. So we've got two classes of people, those who never would have heard of him, those who should have heard of him, and then he makes this new category of people. But, verse 12, also a very famous Bible verse, but as many as received him, to them he gave them the right or the authority to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So if you're trying to make a distinction between who's in the world, who's the seed of the serpent, and who's of the chosen and the seed of the woman, John just lists both of those groups and said, neither one of them are ready for Jesus. But there's going to be a new group in this world that's ready for Jesus. And, and it's not to what family you're born to, it's not to what you, what your family believes. It's going to be a new class of people, people who are born of God. And it's not going to have interest in whatever background you have. It's going to be a new category of people called children of God. They all used to be known as the children of Abraham, and they thought they were not the world. But gee, John is introducing to us a new group of people. Just skipping down a little bit further in John 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So indicates to us the expanse of Jesus' atoning work. Um, you know, on the Day of Atonement, um, Yom Kippur, that, that sin sacrifice wasn't atoning for the Philistines or the Babylonians or the whomever it is. That was only intended for Israel, but now we're going to have a lamb that's going to have power to reconcile the world, a new category of people. And we all know after John 3, 16, 3, 17, skipping to John 3, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So not only are the children of Abraham or the seed of the woman, going to be saved. Even some of the seed of the serpent <laughs> are going to be brought in to a group of people that are sanctified, set apart by the Lord. So um, there is a world that God loves. Who is in that world? What aspect of the world does God love? Because these Bible passages also tell us that we're not supposed to love the world. And this is kind of the, the unfolding that I've seen in the Gospel of John. At the beginning part, there's an introduction of the scope of the Messiah's work. It is worldwide. But by the time you get to John 17, and he has his disciples, and he has those who follow him, then, excuse me, follow him, then there is another realignment of the world and those who belong to him. And it's sort of a reminder to them, they are going to be the new, if, if you don't mind me saying, the new Israel in the world. They're going to be the new group of people that will not be worldly. They will minister to the world, but they will have a new relationship with God, a relationship that was promised to Israel that they never really enjoyed. Now they're going to have a relationship with the Lord that surpasses anything that we can actually conceptualize. So here, let me help you unfold some of my belief in that. You, you read the 
opening chapters of the book of John. Who does God love in John chapter 4? He loves the Samaritan woman and his people of the Samaritan town. Talk about a group of people who were not loved by the Jewish folks. They avoided Samaria. But now Jesus is sort of defining what part of the world would belong to him. It will be Samaritans. Who does, who does God love in John chapter 6? Well, all those whom the Father draws to him. And John 6 is all compare and contrast with Moses in the wilderness, feeding the people of Israel, and they thought they had a special relationship with God, and Jesus says, no, all those people died in the wilderness. You have to come to me to have life. And you can't come to me until the Father draws you. There's going to be a new group coming out of the world that belongs to Christ. Who does, who does God love in John chapter 10? His sheep. And then Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not in this fold. And they're coming in too. And there will be one flock and there will be one shepherd. So you see from these early passages that Jesus is not just singly focused on Israel. He's focused on a whole new group of people. He's going to call out of the world to belong to him. Who does John love in John chapter 15? Those who abide in him, those who have been cleansed by him, those who have been chosen by him. And then this gets us all the way to John 17. Who does God love in John 17? Well, it's pretty specific. It's the disciples who have been given to Christ. These are the ones that are loved by the Father. These are the ones that he is saving out of the world. And in the context of John 17, it's the disciples who are directly, immediately in front of him. But by application, it belongs to all the disciples who come after them, for whom it says in this passage, Jesus is praying for them. So if you think you're the line of the seed of the woman, if you think that you are, um, but you do not have a love for the real seed of the woman, the one who came to crush the head of the serpent, then, then you're not a part of that group that God says affection. I hope that made sense to you. You're on a very small screen, so it's hard for me, for my computer, for me to see any uh, reactions going on there. And then we also learned that those who continue in enmity with the seed of the woman by rejecting the Lordship of Jesus Christ, these are the ones who are going to be rejected with the rest of the world that is under judgment. John 3.17 says God, uh, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. Why would he? It's already condemned. He's come to save the people out of it. So now we, we look at John 17. And this is my strange way of preparing my preaching for a passage is my outlining. And, you know, I'm ready to be challenged by this. If some linguist wants to come to me and say, this is completely out of hand, this is inappropriate, that's fine. But what I do is I line up all the words that by repetition reveal themselves. And you can see there's purple, there's highlighted, yellow, blue. And what do I just see just looking at the structure as it's organized this way? Well, what I see uh, very early is that it's mostly about Jesus. 48 times he's directly referenced. And I have all of his references to the left of the column and it's in purple. So, if you're going to find out what John 17 is about, mostly it's about Jesus. Second most referenced is God the Father, who's in sort of that gold color. 42 times it's referenced. So what do we have here? But a very significant passage that is very concerned about the relationship that Jesus has with his Father. I can make that statement 
just by counting words and, and noting them. Who else is referenced there? I have 34 references to the disciples. In verse, excuse me, in chapter 16, 1633, at the top of the page, that's the last verse of John 16. They're called you, you there. But the rest of them are they, them. So we have a discussion about Christ with his father and how his disciples will relate to both of them. And that's kind of intriguing discussion. John 17 is rich, deep, profound, but this is just my introduction to help us to start seeing what the ground looks like. And then we might want to ask the question, well, where's the Holy Spirit? Wait a minute. I, you know, we're a Trinitarian faith. You've got God the Father, you've got God the Son. Where's God the Holy Spirit? Well, not directly mentioned by name, but by reference and implication, he's there. Especially when you read the preposition in, if we're in him or he's in us, what other way could that possibly be a reality if it weren't for the work of the Spirit bringing to us the benefits of Christ or of us sharing the community of the Father and the Son? All right? That makes sense? I'm going to do a little congregation check. Someone raise a hand if they hear me right now. Okay. All right, you're just being good Presbyterians, just looking down, not saying anything. All right, so um, that leads me just to make some other further observations of this passage. And I can look at this structure and I just keep on seeing more and more things coming out. Um, the one thing that I notice very clearly is the word glory and glorify. And I see it in this section in, in the early part of John 17. And what I also notice is what's absent is the word world. In the section where glory is being mentioned, the word world is not connected to it. Now you careful readers will see that the word earth is there. All of a sudden, when God wants to, or Christ wants to speak about glory, it's not the world there, it has to be the earth. And one thing that we can put together for this, this might even be the, the takeaway point of the whole sermon today, is that Jesus has constantly told his disciples about the glory that he had previously with the Father. He tells them that he came from a place, that he was sent from a place. He prays, God, show them that glory. Show them that glory that I had with you. It seems, and I'm, I'm ready to be challenged on this as well, it seems that that is more important to Jesus than any passion or accomplishment or pursuit of the world. He wants to be back in the presence of the Father. And that is the most glorious thing, I think, as a Christian doctrine, the most glorious thing. And listen, we all love glory. We all want our sports teams to be glorious. We all want to do something that's glorious and have people just think, wow, that was amazing. But the most amazing doctrine about the glory of God, goodness, Presbyterians, that's a part of their first question in their catechism. What's your primary purpose? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. It's our first catechism question. And what do we see here just by way of coloring words? Is that there's the greatest glory is knowing the Father and being with Him. And Jesus can't think of a better place to be than that. And then what is the glory of salvation that you will get to share? by God's grace and glory in that relationship. I don't know how big of a value that is on your hearts. I don't even know if I can comprehend it. But I know that glory is not found anywhere in this world. There is nothing truly glorious. I've had glorious moments. I've scored game-winning soccer goals. I've done, you know, 
I've aced tests, but there is nothing more glorious than knowing that I will be in the presence of God the Father with the Son and sharing in that glory, certainly by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus wanted his disciples to know more than anything. Certainly, the way that they could know that they would be sharing that glory is because they were given to him. Why is the word given so prominently repeated in this passage about what was been given? And here again, early on in John, um, we don't have Jesus explaining some of these concepts, but here as he's concluding his ministry, he indicates to them that the Father had already set his love on a group of people, and in some covenant, agreement all the covenant of redemption in, in some cases that jesus knew he was coming for a specific group of people they would be given to him and he would secure their salvation by living a righteous life for them by even taking on their death and punishment and wrath for them and that jesus would take those that were given to him from the father and he would return them to the father and the father would say this is the best thing that i've ever received a treasure for my son and that treasure is a group of individuals who will then be ushered into the full glory of God I think it's a profound thought I'm sort of embarrassed that I don't think about it as often as I should in fact Jesus starts off this whole according to my arrangement in John 16 33 saying you may have peace in the world um, that in me, in me, of course, how that happened, unless it was the Holy Spirit making that happen, that in me, you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Of course, that word overcome is that word, UK, Nike shoes, conquering. Jesus has triumphed over this world, where the world actually destroy the first man who was to inherit the world, where the world and its temptations and allurements destroy all of us. There was one who came who was victorious over this world and has promised that we would share in the blessings and the benefits of all he, he's accomplished for us. Um, there are a lot of other, I think, important truths to be gleaned from this passage just by way of review looking at it first time um, you get to see that christ thinks that his work is finished you get to see that he has done everything that will bring glory to the father um, you see christ claim in seventeen eleven that he is one with the father so there's a claim of deity that he has then, and that he is interested in making us one with them as an objective. When we ask the question, what is Jesus doing in the world? He's come to make us one with both he, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Um, there is a lot of rephrasing of John 3.16, John 1.12, through these passages. Um, and certainly we see at the end of the passage why this has been famously called the high priestly prayer because we see in 17 1 that jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven and gets to pray but all the way at the end of this passage in verse 18 jesus says as you sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world for their sakes i sanctify myself that they may be sanctified by the truth. Of course, we know thy word is true. But the point here is just as a high priest would set himself apart to perform a holy duty that only a high priest or a priest could perform, Jesus is using that priestly language and he's saying just as a priest prepared a sacrifice that God would find acceptable and God would see as a sweet aroma, Jesus is saying, I'm doing the same thing, and I'm going to make you a, a 
priestly class of people in this world so that God would receive all of your devotions and see it as if it was done in me. You know, if you read through the Old Testament, there's plenty of passages where the priests of God became corrupt and fell from their duties. And there is a longing for a future priest to come. And Christ is that priest. Not only is he a, a future king, a future prophet, he's also the future priest to come. So this is just a, an instruction to prepare for a deeper look at uh, John chapter 17. But I did want to conclude by reading some other passages also written by John. And if you want to look at those passages, this is from 1 John. And he's still speaking about the world. It's still a concern for him to discuss the world, for the followers of Jesus to know their place in the world. And so this is what we read in 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And, if you ask me, that is pretty amazing that God would take sinners like me and say, I'm going to give him everything that he can, so he can inherit everything that belongs to me. I don't understand that grace, but I'm sure grateful for it. He says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. In this world, there's still going to be conflict, and they're not going to understand who we are in this world as a, as a chosen and elect people given to Christ. But we are going to recognize what manner of love that is, that God would call us to himself. And that also reminds us of the reason why we are to be sent to the world, too, so that we could fulfill uh, the calling of bringing other people in the world to the Lord. First John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Important prepositions there through how would we ever be able to live through him if it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the Son to us and also us identifying what our role is in this world is to live through Christ. And where is Christ now? See that the right hand of the Father standing in our defense, interceding for us, preparing a place for us to live with him for eternity. We are to gaze on where Christ is seated in the heavenlies and not to find our glory or fulfillment in the world. But we are to see it as a place where God has called us to minister. And then finally, 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. But what? What what was that? How many people right now have absolute boldness on the day of judgment? Isn't there something within you as it is within me? It's like, it's going to be a little tender day. I don't know if I have all my ducks in a row. How can you have boldness on the day of judgment? Well, he tells us. Because as he is, as Christ is, so are we in this world. Just as Christ is the inheritor of this world because he was the obedient son, you, my friend, brothers and sisters, you can be bold on that day because you know what Christ receives? That's everything you're going to receive. You're going to have, you know, what Christ was longing to experience? Eternal communion with the Father? He's going to bring you into that thing of you. And that's going to be your world. <laughs> that's going to be your new world. So 
Um, as a sinner, I need to be reminded of these passages and about how glorious the gospel is and how sweet the gift is that God has for all those who are called according to his purposes. And I would say with that, I will conclude my sermon with a prayer. If someone raises their hand, I will pray. I see that hand. I see that hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray for the ministry of the word to speak to us. In a you know, mysterious way, the word brings us person Christ and helps our minds to comprehend all that he's done for us in space and in time. He took to himself the human body to be the son of man with all of its reasoning and will and was able to perform everything that uh, the first son of man could not do. Your son called Israel could not do. And the one thing that Jesus does and reminds us of is that he brings us into your glory. And the only way this is done because God in his mercy sees us. When he looks at us, he sees Christ. So I pray that you would encourage your church with these truths as they live and work to your glory in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother, we had to mute you so, uh, so you can hear us now. And we thank you for that excellent exposition of uh, John 17. Thank you for preaching to us this morning. Um, and uh, friends, our, our hymn of response is number 521. Let's stand and sing 521. My hope is built on nothing less. Built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness bears his lovely face, I rest upon his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ's solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Friends, it's been a real joy to worship with you this morning. Just a little bit of trivia uh, for you. Uh, Pastor Roloff, who preached to us this morning, he was church planting in AR Church in Orange County, California. That church uh, is closed, but um, he's now a pastor in Tennessee in the ARP church, where one of his elders is Mike um, Thomas 
Thomason, who is one of our provisional elders here, and many of you uh, got to meet uh, with him. So, uh, anyway, with all that in mind, friends, receive this benediction. Uh, it comes from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let's turn to number 179 uh, and sing our closing song in our clear soul. Now blessed be Jehovah God, the God of Israel, who with wondrous works in glory that excel, who only do it wondrous works in glory that excel. And blessed be his glorious name to all eternity. The whole earth and his glory filled. Amen. So let it be. The whole earth and his glory filled. Amen. So let it be. Lord willing, next Sunday we'll be back on our normal schedule. We'll be starting a new sermon series. Thursday, this Thursday, and then YouTube on Saturday. So we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>